Good afternoon. I'm Donald Morris. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2019 NZBBC interviews. Uh, NZBBC stands for New Zealand Baby Boomer Composers. Um, over this series, I'm interviewing two composers from Auckland, two from Hamilton, two from Wellington, two from Christchurch, and two from Dunedin. The series is hosted by the New Zealand School of Music at Victoria University and Sound Centre for New Zealand Music. Very pleased today to be able to welcome Philip Norman, who's come to, from Christchurch to talk to us today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Philip, first of all. Philip's a composer, conductor, author, speaker, educator and publisher. He's been presenting work to New Zealand audiences for over four decades. His output of over 250 compositions ranges from orchestral, chamber music and opera, through secular and sacred choral and vocal works to musicals. His music has been performed in many countries by organisations as diverse as the Vienna Boys Choir, the Kemerova Philharmonic Orchestra in Siberia, the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough, UK, and the Western Australian Ballet in Perth. Philip holds a PhD in musicology and is the award-winning author of Douglas Lilburn, His Life in Music, as well as the compiler and publisher of John Ritchie at 90, a festschrift. Philip was a recipient artist of a grant from Lady Adrian Stewart as a result of her 2009 Arts Foundation Award for Patronage. He was invested as a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services music and music theatre in the 2015 Queen's Birthday Honours List. And now to my first question for Philip. I'm interested to hear from you about, first of all, where you were born um, and what your family life was like in terms of music, your siblings, your parents, your grandparents. What kind of musical influence was were, were around you when you were young? I was born in Christchurch. Uh, and my mother was uh, very musical and uh, my father really enjoyed singing a lot. He was a, a long standing member of the Christchurch Leader Tafel. I think he membership started in 1950, so it goes back a wee way. I uh, had the first 10 years of my life in Christchurch and then uh, my father um, became uh, founding headmaster of a school in Masterton called Rathgill College uh, and my mother became by default, with there only being three members on the staff, the music teacher there as well. Uh, so. Probably the worst occupation one could think of to have as a father as a teenager would be a headmaster, mm -hmm. and uh, I drew that one. Uh, it wasn't uh, quite some consolation having my mother as a music teacher because I was able to uh, explore music uh, in perhaps greater depth uh, than uh, had I uh, than I would have um, had she not been a musical mother. Uh, my original passion really was um, cricket, um, sports, and uh, right through most of childhood I was uh, dreaming more of uh, becoming a professional cricketer over in England, uh, but slowly the, the music took hold and um, pushed the sport to the side. By the time I left school, uh, I think I played my last game of cricket uh, at the age of 18 and never looked back. Cause Music and sports don't mix in terms of rehearsals come practices, as I'm sure many of you might find out. Yeah. Uh, so Rathkeel came after primary, so what about a primary school? Did you learn an instrument at that age? Uh, yes, well, it sort of came after primary, uh, shifted while I was still at primary age. But uh, no, I was one of the early students at Christchurch School of Instrumental Music, as it was known back then, on... Um, started on the cello, which was taller than I was when I began. Uh, I didn't realise at the time, but uh, I think about half of the uh, NCSO cello section were taught by the same teacher uh, that uh, I had back then. That was Ellen Doyle. Um, and, uh, uh, well, yes, that was really it. started on the, uh, the cello. Uh, I remember I must have been able to sing quite well because at Standard 4 I recall singing the solo verse in Home on the Range for our annual production at Onward School. Um, beyond that I have no musical memories of that time at all. Uh, so Christchurch at that time was quite unique in New Zealand in terms of what was on offer to young people. 
Uh, well, I suppose it was, although it was very early days with that CSIM uh, uh, organisation. Um, I think it started in the mid 50s, and I was there five years later. So it's, it was beginning. But uh, for those of you who don't know what Donald's referring to, uh, uh, back in the mid 1950s, the government said to, to all primary schools in the country, uh, "Who would like some money to have some music going on your schools?" And uh, schools throughout the country said, "Yes, we would." Uh, individual schools, but in Christchurch there was the person in charge of the Canterbury uh, music education um, uh, who said to all the schools, why don't we pull the resources and we could get one really good out of ours uh, scheme. Uh, and they Robert did. Perks. Robert yeah. Perks, thank yeah. you. Uh, and um, yeah, Christchurch remained extremely strong for decades after that decision uh, in the in the music education, mm. primary and then secondary. Mm. So it was a little bit of a culture shock for me to go from that environment, which was starting to go up to Masterton, where they didn't even have somebody who could play the cello, mm -hmm. uh, and it was impossible to get lessons. Uh, and uh, Rathkeel's a little bit out in the countryside uh, too. It's another five miles out mm. uh, in the old measurements. Uh, so, um, yeah, it was um, a, a real musical desert uh, there. I, I had a, a graphically brought home to me really a week ago I was uh, what they call a, a commentator on the Christchurch uh, Schools Orchestral Festival and walked out on stage and asked me to say a few words and I couldn't help but remembering back to my own childhood when I saw this massed orchestra of 400 schools or whatever that in, in my day in the Wairapa, if there were more than four instrumentalists on a stage, we'd call it an orchestra <laughs> back then. Uh, the very slim pickings. But I did enjoy being in the uh, Wairapa in the 1960s because uh, it, as I tongue-in-cheek say, it uh, was, gave me a good insight to what it must have been like to grow up in the 1940s and the 50s in the rest of New Zealand. It was one of those backwaters where time did not seem to have touched. So mm -hmm. in that respect, I'm mm -hmm. appreciative, uh, and in many other ways too, in case anybody who's from Masterton or wherever ever comes across this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So um, after high school, you made a decision to study music at university. Was there a gap? Did you go straight into that? Uh, no, I went straight in, but I hadn't really thought uh, uh, what I wanted to do other than... Um, by that stage, I was really very keen on uh, music. Uh, uh, I did start learning the piano, or my mother insisted I learned the piano. And um, I just, uh, I had a teacher who was just straight out of a Dickens novel. Uh, and his idea of finger subtlety exercises was to put my hand out and go like that on each one and say, is it hurting yet? Um, <laughs> in order to try and get them working. Uh, and uh, I hated those lessons, needless to say. Uh, so I got I passed grade three uh, by two marks or something, and the, the Dickens, Dickens character was heard muttering, the devil looks after his own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I stopped learning the piano at that point, but uh, uh, really started to enjoy it and got into improvis improvisation uh, in a big way. Uh, and uh, learning all the pop songs of the day. This was sort of third form. Uh, and it suddenly occurred to me that uh, it was much quicker to make up my own pieces than to learn other people's pieces. So I started dabbling in composition right from that early age as a result of this keyboard uh, uh, exploration. And uh, my piano playing uh, improved markedly after I left that teacher. Uh, Although some would say it went downhill very mm -hmm. quickly. But, hmm. Did you play any other instruments? Uh, well, the cello still kept up. They eventually found a, a teacher, and funnily enough, it was Fred Page's daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she used to come up, um, and, uh, uh, and then I switched to the double bass, uh, and, uh, and that introduced me into jazz, and uh, so mm -hmm. you know, I was lost to classical music for at least... Uh, three or four years, uh, but I was developing a, a, a singing voice and uh, so really my main instrument became um, bass baritone uh, mm -hmm. at an early age and 
I, I hadn't really thought about going to university, but uh, that was all one did back then. Um, and I hadn't really thought about where to go, except the fact that I missed Christchurch, because mm -hmm. I had left there before I was ready to leave, I think, mm -hmm. so I just enrolled at Christchurch. To do composition, or...? Oh, there wasn't uh, such a thing as learning composition there uh, then. They had this wonderful thing, uh, and uh, any student who has a student loan will be green with envy. It was called a studentship. Uh, that was where they paid students to go and get their uh, university degree, and uh, in return, that student would then go to teachers' college, where they would get paid, and then they had to basically pay back by working for however many years you had the studentship. So I came up with a small profit at the end of um, uh, the three years, but I'd signed up really to be a teacher. And um, in the interview for that, they said, oh, economics, that's a good subject, that's the coming subject of the future. We suggest you should study economics amongst your music and English. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a, an economist I am not. Um, so I, I did a double degree in English and music, and then uh, by the time I'd done three years of music and uh, written a number of student operators, I'd been well and truly bitten by the music bug. Mm -hmm. So the, the people on the staff at Canterbury at that time, the composers who would have influenced you, would have been John Ritchie? Oh, well, he was on the staff, yeah. and, and so was John Cousins. I don't know if I would say they influenced me in any way, because uh, there was no such thing as composition tuition then, uh, or at least if there was, I didn't come across any. Um, I, I just did the straight music one, two and three, where you learned how to harmonise in the vein of Lovelock, mm -hmm. uh, and then more of Lovelock in second year, and uh, lots more of Lovelock in the third year, and, th and that was really it. Um, uh, I think we, we did have a, a composition paper with John Cousins in our final year at, uh, in stage three, um, and forgive me, John, if you're listening, but he was in his stage of um, uh, naval contemplation, and he had uh, uh, turned his basement into uh, what he called a gigantic womb, which was, had no lights uh, uh, except for a little shaft of light and we would sit round the shaft of light and um, I don't know what we did really, but we, we got through a whole year of that and uh, uh, we all graduated. You learned to be creative. Oh, I think so. Think laterally. It's the uh, simplest but hardest music paper I ever had to set. In those days, 100% of the marks were on your final exam paper. And John's Exam opened it up, and it was a question like, write about music. And that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to fill in three hours writing about music. So uh, I can't really remember what we learned back then, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, he, he was inspiring. And you would have gone through with another composer, Chris Cree Brown, who was also. No, no, Chris wasn't a composer at all back then. He, uh -huh. he was. Uh, he, he came another four or five years later. Uh, he was more into theatre, I think, uh -huh. from memory. Uh -huh. um, no, uh, we, we had a strange group of people. Uh, I hope they're not listening, but um, we, we ended up with about four PhDs out of this very small group of mm -hmm. eight people, but mostly they were on the music history mm -hmm. side of things. So you continued straight from the bachelor's degree into the master's and PhD, or did you come back later? Uh, well, apart from a, a year at Teachers College, um, in order to pay back part of this uh, studentship, Loan. Um, I, I did a two-year masters and then teachers' college, and then came back to um, do a PhD. Uh, I so enjoyed the research aspect of the masters, uh, and my paper was on the, the influence of jazz on 20th-century music, if you like. So it uh, really opened up um, a whole new avenue of sound, and although it may just seem a matter of course to you now. Uh, at that time, there was um, one book on jazz in the University of Canterbury Library, and that happened to have been written by, I think it's Avril Dankworth, um, and she got through the senses by having a Dankworth name, I think he was uh, allowed to. The previous 
professor of music before John Ritchie had actually banned jazz from from Canterbury University, so uh, there had been none inside the building uh, from up till about 1963, so it really was foreign territory. Mm-hmm. That uh, would have been Vernon Griffiths. That's correct, yes. 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 Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, recall, I didn't, didn't know Vernon Griffiths much, but I did meet him. Uh, uh, 20 years after he retired, uh, I went round and uh, the burning question on his lips, the first one he asked me was, tell me, Philip, what do you think of Chord 3? <laughs> Which was absolute no-no in Lovelock terms. You never use Chord 3, but in the late 60s, early 70s, every single soft pop song had Chord 3 in it. So that was his big yeah. issue. Uh, so how did you manage the transition from spending three years of Lovelock to becoming a composer with his own voice? <laughs> well, some would say I still haven't found my own voice. Uh, no, I learned at Nymarsh Theatre, um, a wonderful institution there. We had a great uh, uh, musical society, Canterbury University Musical Society, which uh, I helped lower the tone of quite considerably when I arrived by writing a whole lot of comic operettas, and uh, we had lots of fun. And I, I learned heaps about music and uh, theatre and uh, all the sorts of things that you'd weren't taught in the mm-hmm. lectures, and, and so it was trial by exploration, uh, mm-hmm. trial and error, and uh, so that uh, really got me into it. Uh, as I say, there was no composition taught there in any formal sense. That that was not going to come for probably till the next decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but when I uh, I wanted to carry on. Uh, researching and uh, I'd got really interested in composition and my solution was if I wanted to be a New Zealand composer and I couldn't learn it at doctorate level, there were no PhDs in composition or DMASs or whatever they're called these days, then the thing to do would be to study other New Zealand composers and that would surely I could learn from studying New Zealand composers and uh, become one myself that way. So I started off writing uh, a thesis on the complete history of composition in New Zealand uh, and uh, quickly realised that there were more than the three or four that were in the library shelves and zeroed in on Douglas Lilburn. Uh, So my PhD thesis was on the instrumental or the non-electronic music of Douglas Lilburn. Still haven't found a use for my PhD, but the um, the actual uh, thesis itself I managed to convert into a, a biography of Douglas Lilburn that finally mm. made we'll it to come, the shelves. Come back to that a little bit later, but this approach of studying the music of New Zealand composers, do you think that had the result of your music having a New Zealand identity in some way? Uh, well, well, it was certainly my intent. Uh, uh, back then, um, everybody was really uh, keen to find out the relationship between Douglas Lilburn's music and the environment because every second commentator said that they could hear the sea-spumed coast of Kaikoura in bars 9 and 10 of the Aotearoa and uh, the um, you know, exposition of um, Allegro had the Otago Hills so we were very open to uh, these suggestions and um, so yes I went in very hopefully that I'd come out the other end um, sounding like a New Zealand composer but I did a series of informal tests and played uh, um, music without telling the listeners who it was and got them to put down the nationality of the listeners and uh, in the case of Lilburn uh, 100% put English down as his Mm. being an English composer, so there went that theory. Mm. So what, what do you make of his um, call for establishing a New Zealand identity, his famous Cambridge speech? How do you think that's played out over the decades? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think parts of it very well, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's a really sensible thing, and uh, uh, I consider myself a New Zealand composer, and uh, I try wherever possible to um, capture the... Um, sounds if there are any or capture the themes of uh, New Zealand and my compositions because as a freelance composer I feel I need to justify my financial existence mm-hmm. to 
the state, if you like, um, if they're going to give me money to write material, then if they're going to choose me as, uh, as opposed to somebody who lives anywhere else in the world who may well be able to write better the music than I can, then I've got to have a reason for it. And so wherever possible, I'll set New Zealand so texts. How do you, or, yeah, how do you capture the New Zealand flavour? Do you, do you use Maori elements at all in your music? I have used some uh, Maori elements, but in, in Christchurch, uh, one has to look awfully hard to find a high Polynesian content. Sure. Uh, it certainly is the least uh, uh, Polynesian city of the lot. Um, the wonderful flute player Isabella there might recall um, Rangi Ruru, her school commissioned me to write something for the 125th anniversary, I think it might have been, and they're very strong with the kapahaka mm -hmm. and uh, included um, one of that and uh, kapahaka uh, accompanied by their orchestra and then flipped it around and the, the kapahaka accompanied an orchestral version mm -hmm. of it. And it was a curious result, but it seemed to work quite nicely in that uh, particular one. That was one part of a sort of panoramic history of uh, uh, then. Um, one of the compositions that really stick in my mind as, as a favourite from mine was one I uh, wrote for the uh, first and only uh, annual festival of all the national youth music groups. So this ranged from brass band, orchestra, choir, pipe band, jazz orchestra, uh, I'm sure I've missed one out, and um, uh, a Maori mm -hmm. concert party, as they were sort of alluded to back then, but traditional, and combined them all together in a, a, a gigantic work called Ballad of Settler McGee, and uh, that Maori element was certainly very strong mm -hmm. in the... In the the uh, lyrics I wrote myself were all about the Treaty of Waitangi because it was a really big issue at that particular time and my point was that we'd spent 150 years, which was what this 1990 was celebrating, uh, and we'd got nowhere because all the provisions of the treaty had yet to be really discussed. Uh, mm. But throwing all the mix of New Zealand things in there was uh, quite special. And mm. I can tell you uh, that the sound of 400 instrumentalists all playing a fortissimo in the mm. Christchurch Town Hall is a sound that uh, you won't find in many mm -hmm. places. It was uh, quite magnificent, or well, the sound that is not my composition, although I thought the composition was all right. So just backtracking a little, the New Zealand composers that, whose music you were studying, who did they include beyond Douglas Lilburn? Oh, uh, well, when I first started out, uh, it was... Uh, um, the first three, uh, well, as you know yourself, Donald, back in those days, um, New Zealand composition began with Douglas Lilburn and ended with Jack Boddy, and mm -hmm. uh, there was a direct lineage uh, with Douglas in the first wave, and then uh, David Farquhar, um, Larry Prude and Edwin Carr. Uh, uh, on a very generous day, the Wellington composers would include John Ritchie mm -hmm. and um, Tremaine from Auckland, and then the next wave were all the, what I call the uh, war babies, mm -hmm. who uh, basically tied up all the opportunities for music in New Zealand for 30 years after they um, reached university. Uh, and that was it. Yeah. So uh, I, I got yeah. to know the music of the war babies very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what about um, European influences on you? What composers from overseas, like going back historically, who would you feel influenced by? Oh, well, uh, many, many composers, really. Mm. Uh, Favourite composers uh, uh, would be Mozart at number one and Bach at number two, and then the whole host uh, after that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came out of an uh, Anglican background, uh, early childhood, and um, singing was uh, steeped in the, some of the, the glorious uh, Anglican church music, which really is uh, quite glorious, and then if you take that back into the uh, great uh, religious works of the uh, earlier composers, uh, that was really strong. What really got me interested in music at school was uh, the three Gilbert and Sullivan operas that uh, were put on there, so that was a, a really strong incentive for me to um, get into writing music. Uh, 
and then through music theatre, um, later people like Stephen Sondheim were not a household name back then, a very alternative back in the 70s. I uh, got to know his um, earlier musicals very well uh, and lots of jazz and uh, of course long-haired, spaced out, uh, hippie rock of the, my teenage years, of 70s and late 60s. What about influence of electronic, electroacoustic music in your own compositions? To what degree have you incorporated elements? Oh, I did, did a, a lot. Uh, I, I really couldn't get excited by the early uh, analogue things that the studio here was. It was just sort of, you know, bits of sound that were sound effects. And uh, so that, that whole... Um, generation of electronic music um, bypassed me as a composer, it just mm -hmm. held no interest at all. Although I really liked, in an intellectual way, listening to what others were doing, it just certainly didn't appeal. Uh, but then the first digital age revolution came on with um, particularly that wonderful instrument, the um, Yamaha DX7 and uh, uh, that FM synthesis. And uh, so I got heavily into electronics and for the next um, 20 years I did a, a lot of uh, either backing tracks using this technology or compositions in itself. Uh, a couple for the Royal New Zealand Ballet at that time um, uh, took up a megabyte of computer memory, I, I remember that. A 60, 60 minute work took up a megabyte of memory on the old Mac Plus which is just quite extraordinary if you think about it now. It was very difficult to do, uh, but very rewarding um, because you were starting to get the, mm. well, you know what it's like today. It was the beginnings of this, so it's real sort of pioneering stuff. But the DX7 wasn't a multi timbral unit and they were so expensive. They were five grand, I think, in 1981. Uh, so the only way I was able to put a whole composition together was to have two of them and then each track you had to really careful lis carefully listen to each other uh, and then you'd add a third track by unplugging the first one uh, <laughs> so that uh, you know the sounds didn't jar. A anything can happen with those really pure waveforms that the uh, DX7 mm -hmm. put out. But, yeah, so yes, uh, mm -hmm. although people don't, uh, well those few people who are interested in my music don't usually associate me with electronics, I did do a lot of work with electronic. So other compositional techniques, you, I know from listening quite, to quite a bit of your music, you've done lots and lots of different genres. Are there any techniques you've kind of explored and then just decided that no, that's not for you, like serial music for instance? Um, well, well, yes, I did uh, uh, do serial um, music in the 1970s. I, I was trying all sorts of things out and as a result of that I think um, I, one of my pieces is the very first piece that uh, was published in the world of a computer notated score. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at Canterbury University in 1976 there was a whole group of people that were looking at uh, ways of plugging into a computer and play, um, playing a, a little organ keyboard and getting the notation out the other end, which may sound familiar to you as uh, exactly what we do now, but back then it was uh, uh, ahead of its time in the world, really. Um, and uh, they needed a computer who knew nothing about this new... Uh, they needed a composer who knew nothing about computers. Uh, and I fitted that bill quite nicely, and they got me in to put in a composition, or write a composition, and put it in so that it would be the first published one, so they could mm -hmm. put it part of their writing up process. And I thought, well... It has to be one with numbers, it has to be a 12-tone work, so mm -hmm. I studied 12-tone music mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. did the first uh, publication that way. Um, so maybe we can actually move on to some of your music. Um, I noticed you've got over 250 works listed on, on, on the Sounds website or, or here and there. Mm. Um, interested in works that stand out for you as being significant in some way. And I mean, one in particular sort of stood out in my mind is the one called Earthquake. Oh, right. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit, a little bit about Earthquake, and we'll have a listen to it as well. Sure. Um, uh, this um, 
funnily enough, was about an earthquake. Uh, we had one or two of them in Christchurch. Uh, in fact, I think 10,000 of them, although technically they were aftershocks. But as I've said somewhere before, if it quacks like a duck, it looks like a duck, then it probably is a, an earthquake rather than an aftershock. Uh, after the first earthquake, which mostly nobody was killed and there were one injury, I think, a stubbed toe or something, um, uh, I thought this would be wonderful to capture uh, the audio quality of the earthquake because it's not often that the composer sits through one. So I applied to Creative New Zealand and got a funding grant uh, for that and started work on that. But then uh, a few months later, uh, the earthquake that killed so many people occurred and um, it just felt all wrong to be trying to capture that. So uh, the piece changed direction entirely and became a, uh, a human response. Uh, I found this wonderful poem by Gary McCormick, which uh, was filled with anger. And uh, uh, I set that to music. Um, and uh, Yes, I'm, I'm wary about playing it because uh, I, I did give a talk and played it and uh, at the end uh, I got a number of people come up and say, I wish you hadn't played that, it just brought it all back to us and uh, mm. uh, shame on you for not having more sense. So Isabella, if you want to leave the room, I'll quite understand uh, the, this takes, this takes six minutes. Yeah, let's, and let's, yeah. let's hear all of it. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. It's such a unique piece. miserable, low-life bastard. We saw you on the 4th of September, crawling into town on your spineless spine, giving us a flick, looking us over. An earthquake straight from the yellow pages. You know the drill? The torch, the batteries, the bottles of water. September, you were only the piano player, tickling the ivories, thin moustache, checking us out, eyeing the women on the dance floor. venomous tongue in check. A snake that lived in a crack in the earth, all black coils and shining musculature.
I saw you whip up a blind alley full of hatred and dark breath. Grim clouds could only pity us. us down on the jagged ground, shook the streets and the city buildings, ripped the spire from the cathedral. All that man had made was used to batter them. Tourists taking photographs. Babies taken in pairs. The hikers in the hills. The ones buried beneath us still. You miserable bastard of a thing. Time has come, said the drummer to the drum, when I can make no sense of it. Thank you for that. Complete change of direction. <laughs> Can we have a listen to the work for viola and orchestra? Tell us a little about this. Uh, sure. Um, uh, this is called uh, When Gravity Fails. Uh, it's got quite a chequered history, but I'll try and write it um, and speak it quickly. Um, uh, when my uh, youngest daughter, Caroline, uh, learned to play the viola. Uh, we got our first viola on Christmas Eve and uh, there was no time to get to the music shops to get any viola clef music for her to... She had already learned the violin, but uh, we wanted to get her used to the viola clef. So I just dug into my computer and got out uh, some music that I'd written that she was familiar with through having either sung in primary school music festivals that I'd written and uh, put those into the treble, uh, into the viola clef, and so she could look at it and pretend to be sight reading, but really playing by ear. It was a, a good start. And uh, there are a number of these pieces, uh, and one of them was a, a, a little piece I'd written for my older daughter, Isla, who was getting really interested in jazz flute. 
uh, and uh, it was called Isla's Blues. Uh, anyway, I put these all together in a, an album for a graduated album for violas, uh, and. Uh, gave a copy to Brownie Gibson Cornish to say farewell. Uh, she had been a composition tutor, of, uh, student of mine when she went overseas. Anyway, Brownie ended up in Auckland and uh, um, they insisted that um, as part of the uh, award she had then that she should play some New Zealand music as part of a concert. And this is Jack Body was insisting everybody who had a, one of these little awards was going to play a piece of New Zealand music. <laughs> and not somebody else's music. I'm sure Jack uh, had, had my music in mind when he insisted that, but tough Jack, wherever you are, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, um, Brian, he remembered this, got it out and played it in its sort of grade five version. And then uh, the Auckland Philharmonia had wondered whether I could put together a uh, orchestrated version of these and suit them up a little bit. Uh, so that Brownie can feature in the, as a soloist with the orchestra the following year. And, uh, and Player of the Year, I think they have every year there. So, long story short, here's a simple old blues and B flat uh, with Brownie Gibson Cornish, who came back over from overseas to record it with the engine, so it's part of the sounds recording. <laughs> fantastic uh, subject for many ways. Uh, he uh, was a closet diary writer, so uh, 
there unbeknownst to most people were many years of his life uh, and preoccupations documented in diaries, uh, uh, which is a wonderful thing for anybody attempting to do a biography because then you have it in black and white. It's uh, uh, how he was thinking, so there was no doubt about how he was thinking. Um, yeah, so it was uh, quite easy in a way, and I use it with easy advisedly, uh, to write a book that was quite readable because Douglas was such a, an articulate person with phrases and writings himself that made for interesting reading. So I didn't, didn't have to press up the old cell's ear to make a silk purse because the silk purse was already there when they wrote quoted anything of him that just fed off the page. He was a terrible poet, just to put things in perspective, but uh, his, his uh, prose writing was really wonderful. He could have been a New Zealand writer if he wished. I'm sure we do a whole lot of just on writing that book. <laughs> that's just a taste if you haven't read it. Please do. I'd um, just like to take a few minutes just to take some questions from the floor. I was intrigued that you chose the melodrama form, speaking with music for the earthquake piece. Uh, I think it worked very well. What, what led you to, uh, to choose that? Uh, well, as I said in the introduction before, I wasn't originally intending to do that. I was trying to capture the uh, uh, how an earthquake felt. Um, and. Uh, I think I did quite successfully capture how it felt in the background music because when I was writing this, there were about 10 earthquakes that occurred as I was writing, so it was actually very easy to catch the rhythms, and they were remarkably regular, really. Uh, I saw that piece of poetry and it really just hit home. Um, Gary wrote that the, the night after the earthquake, and it, was, it had such an immediacy in it. Uh, uh, and that was how a lot of people were feeling that great anger about it happening, but it's not the normal way of expression in public. I mean, most people were expressing sadness and, and grief. Gary McCormick knocked that, uh, that anger uh, on the head, and I, I just couldn't resist setting it really. And, and words can say things. So much more directly than music. Music can enhance, I hope they did that, what the words are. So, yeah, a melodrama? I don't, I don't know if I'd call it a melodrama. But I'm using it in the strict musical sense of monodrama or oh, speech yeah, music, yeah. yes. That's yeah, so an old theatre hand when you talk about melodrama, you talk about heightened emotions and not a very good way. Well, I think we'll wrap it up then, but thank you so much for it. Thank you.